Well, welcome once again. And today, as we're continuing our daily devotionals through the uh, letter of James, we've been looking at the issue of faith and works. And uh, th there's a lot of confusion, obviously, in many people's lives as to how do we balance those two things together. Keeping in mind that when we talk about the grace of God, grace by its very nature is, is not balanced. It's very imbalanced. It's all of God. It's none of me. And so when we talk about coming to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, that we are saved by grace, and that grace finds its access into our hearts by our faith. That in other words, my faith is to say, God, I'm trusting in Jesus's sacrifice on the cross to cleanse and save me from my sins. And I'm putting my faith in that. I'm not putting it faith in something else, particularly like another religious system, which by the way, all other religious systems are based upon salvation by works. And so really, it really becomes just that issue of where am I putting my faith? Am I putting my faith in the grace of God or am I putting my faith in works that I do or can do or must do? And there becomes a real contrast. Now, what John, James was dealing with, in, in the, especially in the Jewish-Christian conflict of the time, was there were certain uh, people who, as they were discovering the grace of God, were kind of concluding that they really didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to really, um, they weren't responsible for their behavior any longer. They could just simply live any way they wanted. And uh, it, the term is kind of, you know, the theological term is called antinomianism. They're basically against the law, against the idea of having uh, uh, any responsibility. And, and on one hand, there's a, it's theologically correct to say we're not saved by works and we're not saved by keeping the law, but that doesn't mean that we're exempt from the moral standards and, and directions that we find within the law, that it, it still is a sin, even though I'm saved, it's still a sin to murder and to cheat and lie and to steal and commit adultery and on and on and on. So we, we find that Christians oftentimes get really, really confused on this because they don't understand that it's my faith and the grace of God that saves me. But if I've had that experience, it translates into behavior. And that's where we find in verse 18, in fact, I wanna read a lengthier section we usually do here, verses 18 through 24, where, Paul, where James kind of addresses this more, uh, more directly. He says, and gives an example of Abraham, and then tomorrow we'll talk about the other example of Rahab. But he says, someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. He said, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do, by my deeds. You believe that there is one God? Good, even the demons believe that and shudder. So simply having this kind of amorphous kind of statement of, well, I believe, or I'm a person of faith, or I'm a spiritual person, or I believe in Jesus, uh, doesn't really say much about you if it's not followed up with a lifestyle change as well. Uh, in my first book, I have this statement. It says, if the difference that Jesus makes doesn't make a difference, what difference does it make? And that's the whole point. Jesus is, is uh, living inside of me. The Spirit of God has entered into my life so that it might make a difference in the way that my life lives. And we've talked about this already, so I won't belabor that too much. But in verse 20, he goes on and says, you foolish man. In other words, if you say that um, my faith somehow is not connected to my, my works, then he says, you're, you're a foolish man. He says, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Uh, was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did, and, he, and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. He didn't earn it, but it was credited to him, and he was called God's friend. You see, that person is justified by what he does and not by his faith alone. Now again, this passage has been misused and misunderstood by many to say that therefore we're justified in the eyes of God by our actions. And James is really saying something very, very different. He understood as well as anybody that salvation was by faith. I mean, he grew up... Uh, um, as Jesus' little brother, and he grew up not believing it was a Messiah. We don't know exactly when he came to faith, but it wasn't until after Christ 
had been resurrected and Christ appeared to him. It was only after that that he came to a saving relationship of Jesus. And he understood that he who had been a denier of the Messiah now had become a believer, that that salvation had come to him, not by some kind of previous faith or effort, but had come by the grace of God, opening his eyes to the need he had for a savior. And so, he goes on to use this example of Abraham as probably one of the best examples. Paul uses it over and over again. Why? Because Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, if you will. And so he says, Abraham lived 450 years before there was a law. There was no Mosaic law. He just simply walked by God but based upon faith. And God told him to circumcise his son. He went and circumcised his son. He, God told him to offer up his son a sacrifice. He offered his son up a sacrifice. Now, it doesn't mean that he did, didn't have fainting spells, as Spurgeon called them, where his faith failed him. We know of a couple occasions where you fear, we know that fear of circumstances made him behave in a less than honorable way. But still, the bottom line is when we look at the trajectory of his life, that there was this movement from this first encounter with God until the very end of his life, which was always upward and onward into a greater trust and reliance upon God the Father and the moving of the Holy Spirit and the divine revelation of Jesus Christ. So here again, he says, you know, to say that, uh, that faith doesn't impact my behavior or is disconnected from that, he said, really proves one thing, that you're nothing more than a fool. The wise man says, you know, my faith informs my actions. My faith informs my actions. Whatever I believe to be true, if you will, that's going to determine how I respond. And so if I see myself responding to things in an unfaithful way, it's because I'm really doubting the truthfulness of God's word and God's will and God's commands for my life. You know, uh, I'd love to say so nobly that uh, I've lived with my life, wife in faithfulness for 51 years because I'm such a great guy. But the truth of the matter is I've done that above and beyond anything else because I knew it was outside of the will of God. And by faith, I knew that God's word was true. And I knew by faith that as he says in Proverbs, the man takes fire into his bosom, he'll be burned. I knew that nothing good could come out of such a silliness. And so, We've remained faithful to each other for 51 years because we simply know that's God's will and God's will is always the thing that brings the best into our life. And that's what we want. We want God's best. We don't want to go through any pain or suffering unnecessarily. And so I would just simply say, your faith will inform your actions just that they did with Abraham. We'll wrap this up uh, tomorrow as we take a look at another example of Rahab.